Well, good morning and welcome back to Stories for the Cooped Up and Captive. You know, one of the most frequently uttered phrases to a veterinarian from clients is, man, I could never be a veterinarian because I could not stand the idea of putting animals to sleep. Well, I promise you, not once have I ever woken up in the morning and said, man, I hope I get to put some dogs to sleep today. But I will tell you that as we work our way and manage end of life issues in dogs and cats, I have seen some of the most beautiful acts of humanity and reaped some of the greatest rewards in all my practice. So here comes a story about one, of the, one such episode from early on. You know, in 25 years of practicing veterinary medicine, I've come by the notion that animals have a tendency to evolve in the likeness of their family. This is a story about the Wilsons, Don and Becky, Brett and Aaron, their two kids. They had the sweetest little Cocker Spaniel named Sally. Sally, of course, had the requisite droopy eyes and goopy ears. She had a grade three heart murmur, but she also had the disposition of a nanny. She would meet the boys at the bus every day after school and follow them down to the lake if they went fishing play ball. She would sit and stay. She never ran away. But her claim to fame is that dog never barked. Not once. Now Becky would always make Sally's veterinary appointments at 3.40 in the afternoon after she picked up the boys from school. They'd come into the clinic and I'd scoop Sally up and put her on the exam table and do my physical while Becky and the boys sat on the bench. If they had a question, they'd raise their hands. Hey, Mr. Vet Guy, is Sally going to die? I would assure them that Sally was in excellent health. She was going to be just fine. Then I would give them a handful of freeze-dried liver that they could feed to her while I gave her her injections. Becky was a teller at the Farmers and Merchants Bank. She was also the perpetual homeroom mother, den mother, and chaperoned every trip. Don was a maintenance man at Melster's Candy, but he also had a ladder rack, a drain auger, a bolt meter to do side jobs for 20 bucks an hour. Brett and Aaron were the most polite kids. They might go to school in clothes that were secondhand and patched, but they were always clean. When you called the house, they'd answer, Wilson's residence, can I help you? Manifestation that class knows no dollar sign. The Wilson home would make Sanford and Sons look like the Biltmore Hotel. It was sided in chartreuse Tyvek and tin. Around it there were wheelbarrows without the wheels, lawnmowers without fuel tanks and carburetors that Don had used to parts out. The first sign was when Don started to drive Becky to Sally's veterinary appointments. Next, there was a faded red bandana. As the color started to fade from Becky's cheek and the flesh started to melt from her cheeks, she still, when you would go into the Farmers and Merchants Bank, she would muster up a, hey, Bill, how you doing? She never missed one of the boys' football games. By now, they were in junior high school, but even at the season opener, she was huddled under a mountain of blankets in September. Mother Teresa said, blessed are the sick. She must have been talking about Becky because as she no longer could, she taught the kids how to cook and to clean and to do laundry. She let the boys see her and Don cry, and she talked very candidly about life without them. But what she would not allow was she would not allow a late homework assignment or a missed football practice because mom was sick. Now, Michael Perry says the sadness starts, the real pain starts when you return the last casserole dish. But at Becky's wake, the real pain started for me when I shook hands with Don and I looked past to see Sally laying next to the chair where she and Becky would sit and look at the lake. Now, I would like to think that we do the very best we can for every patient, every client that walks through our door, but Mayo Clinic and the University of Wisconsin could not save Becky, but we were gonna do every single solitary we, thing we could to ensure that the boys had Sally as long as they could. We aspirated every lump, extracted every tooth. We managed her congestive heart disease with top shelf drugs. Protocol price sheets were out the window. Instead of invoices, Don would change out ballast in our fluorescent light fixtures and paint an exam room in exchange. 
But if we were going to dignify this woman's memory, the other thing we had to ensure that that dog never suffered, not for a single solitary day. So on Friday afternoon, I saw the appointment on the schedule and my heart sank. Don, forever a gentleman, spoke because I couldn't. He said, yeah, Bill, I know, this is it. I turned to go get the drugs to put her to sleep and he said, I want to take her home to spend one last night with the boys. I said, Don, I understand, but I don't think she's going to live through the night. Well, she did. And that Saturday morning, I met the guys at the clinic at 6.30 and we cried like babies and said our goodbyes to sweet Sally. A couple of months later, at Brett's last football game, I walked up to Don, who was leaning on the fence. Still looking at the football game, he said, Bill, did I ever tell you about Sally's last night at home? He had not. And he said, well, at 2.30 in the morning, I woke up and tried to stand. It was like I was drunk. I fell to the floor, vomited all, all over, and crawled into the kitchen. Brett was coming out of his room with Aaron on his shoulder in a fireman's carry. The pilot light on the stove had blown out and the house was full of carbon monoxide, natural gas. I said, Don, how in the heck did you guys wake up? He said, it was Sally. She was sitting, staring at the stove, barking and braying like a blue tick hound with a coon up a tree. Now you can call this miracle, you can call it mojo. This story is my personal manifestation of fate and Becky Wilson looking out for her boys. So if all else fails, keep something moving forward. <laughs>